Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Of course, my name is Eric, and you're listening to Double Feature. Here with me today, as always, Michael Kester. We are doing two behemoths. Yeah, on the two, show um, two two hour plus movies yeah. on the show, uh, in sort of a sci fi day, sort of an evil overlords, but not in space. Right, sci fi, giant oppressive. Alternate thing. scary future. Right. <laughs> Under the feigned reality um, of a happy future. Sure. Can you call it alternate scary future when the future has not happened I'm yet? I'm calling it alternate from each other. Okay, that's fine. Um, I thought we were diving into philosophy already, and I was terrified. No, we've got at least another, what, two? We have to talk about spoilers first. Okay, there's going to be spoilers, there's going to be chapters, but before we can spoil the films, we have to name the films. All right, well, I guess in that case, I will say that we are going to cover The Matrix. Oh, God. And Rollerball. All right. Um, this is, this is going to be a little rough. These are some big movies. They're huge movies. And uh, I think we need to explain why we're even talking about them. <laughs> um, we're just going to get right into The Matrix first. You've seen The Matrix, and you probably don't remember anything from it. So Right. Uh, you probably don't remember that it's fucking amazing. Yeah, is you what need I'm to see at. The Matrix again. If it's been any span of time, longer than, say, a year, maybe yeah. a year and a half since uh, you You know, last 10 saw years Matrix, like most people. You need to rewatch The Matrix. Yeah, and then uh, Rollerball, if it's been, oh, I don't know, 40 years since you've seen Rollerball, it might be time to visit that again. Yeah. But you can skip over those, uh, those movies. Um, skip The Matrix first, go to Rollerball, skip Rollerball, go to the Yeah, end. you'll skip M- Rollerball when you realize Mark Zupan is not in the film. <laughs> you had to beat my Mark Zupan reference, didn't you? Yeah, you could skip over the movies if you haven't seen them. You don't want to get spoiled, or you're just tired of hearing us go on and <laughs> on and on. And on we shall go. Let's start with uh, The Matrix. I guess my big question for The Matrix is, this is probably uh, one of the most talked about movies we've ever done. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the question comes up immediately. This was before podcasting existed. Yeah, it's right? true. We're talking about 11, 12 years ago, 13, yeah. what, movie 1999. Movie came out in 1999, do the math. Okay, so long fucking time ago. And uh, it's been talked about to death. The philosophy of the Matrix. Sure, surely there's been talk- probably books called The Matrix and Philosophy. Both the surface elements of the Matrix and the deeper elements of the Matrix have been discussed, uh, really to death. Yes. Where is this place for the Matrix on our show? What's the point? Why is it here? Well, I think the biggest thing that we can bring to the audience of Double Feature, Podmanity, as you are lovingly adorned, is that we watched The Matrix again. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. No, I absolutely know what you mean. The, the thing about The Matrix is that in 1999 and in the subsequent few years, a lot of people discussed The Matrix and it was great and it did a bunch of innovative things and it was really the chief of sci-fi and an achievement in film at the time, mm-hmm. right? So here we are now over a decade later sure, and we go back and we watch it again and this time... It's still a fucking incredible (laughs) achievement in film and nobody has ever gotten to the level that the Matrix achieved. Yeah, right. It's still uh, pretty spectacular in the uh, in the things that it's done Um, there. There's really for all of the so-called imitators over the years. There's really nothing quite like The Matrix, which no. is probably what surprised me the most, yeah. viewing it again. Sure. It had been a while since I'd seen it. I, I knew that it was awesome, <laughs> right? but I needed some affirmation. Right. You needed to actually sit down and have an excuse to... So if we can bring nothing else today, mm-hmm. we've given you an excuse to watch The Matrix again, which is really... I mean, no matter what we aspire to do in the yeah. next 20 minutes, that's that is... That's the best gift we've given you. That is, uh, that's the pinnacle of our achievements today. I think to really get down to it, The Matrix is notable. And yeah. uh, the better question might even be, what's more notable than The Matrix? That's very true. You know, this is a, a movie that's really been built for our show. And I think over 10 years, maybe there's nothing new to say about it. 
uh, maybe we'll waste 20 minutes of your time. Maybe it's something that needs to happen. I think that if after 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, there's still nothing new to say about it, that is in and of itself something worth talking about. That sure. this film has transcended sure. to the point where it is an accepted thing in pop culture. Yeah, I mean, I think while we were uh, watching the movie, we were bordering on a discussion about Americana. Yeah. You know, we're really talking about... This is American cinema. This, oh, fuck that. This is just cinema, mm -hmm. right? This is, uh, we're talking about the history of film. Right. Uh, moments that will be remembered and, and looked at. Uh, you know, it's going to sound ridiculous, but this is kind of the way people talk about Metropolis. Yeah. That's how I feel people are going to talk about The Matrix in I 50 years. I fully agree. They're still talking about it that way today, the people who are talking about The Matrix, if anyone's talking about The Matrix. But I, I mean, it's that goddamn notable. So here we find ourselves in a position, much like we were in, say, The Shining, yeah, where you know a movie has been so pontificated upon by people much smarter than ourselves. And uh, I don't know. We'll see what we have to add. We'll bring it back a little bit. If I could tell you uh, another wonderful, I'll, I'll just try and reserve one of these a year, and I try not to exceed my quota. Okay. If I could tell you a brief personal anecdote about myself in The Matrix. Absolutely. This is, um, this is a really unique place for you and I to be in. Because usually we are the, you know, two idiots in our mid to late 20s who don't know anything about the history of film. Right. However, uh, we were in, what, our teenage years, right? Yeah, when we the Matrix were in came prime film-going time. <laughs> sure. And so we remember the movie. Be, this is almost uh, talking to the person who saw Star Wars when sure. it came out. You know? Yeah. Uh, this is something we remember growing up and here we are all these years later and we can look back at uh how the matrix may have inspired things after it came out or even just that original you know to have a memory of the first time seeing the matrix in a theater when no one knew about it yet that's a hard thing to even remember a yeah. world before the matrix yeah I remember we were just talking about um you know we talked back on closer yeah. about uh the internet in what was that 2004 or yeah. whatever yeah what a bizarre place that was and uh that was an odd year for the internet but i remember the internet in 1999 mm -hmm. i remember um you know irc and yeah. the i talked on uh, last year when i got my one brief moment right i talked about the social network and uh being in college and programming and creating awesome start and all of that and i remember when the matrix came out obviously, uh, before those days. Sure. And that being really personal to me, I, I fucking adored the movie. I lived the Matrix. I took in every little piece of any Matrix-related anything. I bought into every scrap of it. And I think that's what was, for me, the start of a lot of the stuff I talked about in the social network, a lot of that programming stuff. The Matrix, oddly enough made programming and computer nerdery cool similar to the net no not similar to the net at all although that was another the matrix and the net were pretty much my two favorite childhood films yeah. that says something about my childhood um but probably that i didn't watch any movies i think that's exactly <laughs> what that said I, it appealed to this kind of ridiculous gothy nightclub yeah. side of me yeah the one scene with rob zombie the american made was, music to strip by and who would have who would have known that rob zombie would later become something more serious and important uh to film as well yeah. as uh to myself but i enjoyed the trench coat side and sure. the action side and the and, pleather and the sunglasses right the stupid stuff really yeah. and the stupid stuff that the matrix somehow made cool and suddenly programming was cool yeah and hacking hacking and uber geek and yeah. um, multiple monitors uh, multiple fucking having a uh a cage of eight sure. monitors which uh, by the way no kidding and i think i said this on the social network uh show one of my crt monitors literally just ran the matrix code that's how fucking not cool i was basically yeah. that's what i'm getting yeah. at so somehow above all these other great things the matrix did it made code cool yeah that's weird. Well, but it when made it, it opens on that, and that made right? it cool. And when it opens on that shot of the the code, sure. the uh, you know just the prompt there, and different key commands, and then obviously the scrolling matrix text and going out on that, it was the capsule to the fucking cool movie. It has uh, watching it today, it seems like you know this very specific era of '90s film. 
Yeah. There's um uh, I know you detest a lot of the the 90s film. I look. think that the 90s had a lot wrong with it in film. It certainly did. It certainly did. But oddly for me, this reminds me of a very specific part of that. Uh a part that perhaps because it was 1999, it had most of uh it escaped most of the goofy shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Most of the stuff that does not hold up over time and is really lame and eye rolling. There's nothing really lame about this movie. It pretty much preserves its cool the yeah, entire time. Yeah, it really does. Uh, some of the graphics are a little bit dated. But yeah, you have a problem a with the electricity. The lightning does. Yeah, and look I have a, a problem with a lot of the green screen stuff. Yeah, uh, you know, innovation for its time. But as honestly, everybody like, remembers. it doesn't stand in the way of the film for me. Yeah, I think more about the mood that creates and the the physical look of the yeah. film being that. Uh, post 7 90s neo noir green yeah the green well the green letters and the crt monitors and the 90s uh-huh. hacking is something completely separate but i'm thinking more about the the stuff that feels like dark city yeah you know dark city was i think the year before around the same time and you know the matrix is basically that same type of neo noir but with vinyl sure or what's the fancy word for vinyl but not as squeaky uh. not as catwoman Leather? Latex. That's oh, what I wanted. okay. The condom thing. The full body condom. Absolutely. Right. Do you see the similarities between something like this and Dark City? Oh, sure. No, I definitely understand it. I mean, it. beyond the uh, Mr. Hand kind of stuff. It's less detective-y and more reluctant hero. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And not so much reluctant as un- unbeknownst to himself. <laughs> sure. He's the hero. And we get Unwitting this- Unwitting hero? Yeah, Is that there possible? you go. That's perfect. They do this great thing in the beginning, and they touch on it again when they get to the pill scene. Sure. Where he's- uh, cubicle nerd yeah by day thomas anderson works in a cubicle and by night he becomes neo sure but you get this wonderful thing with the pills oh no it's not with the pills it's when he's talking to the agent in the in the inquiry mm-hmm. and the agent says you have this life as thomas anderson oh yeah yeah, yeah. and you have this life as right. neo and he says one of them is going somewhere and the other one leads nowhere Right. But he doesn't specify. Sure. We get the idea that he knows what he's <laughs> right. talking about. Right. And but it's just this wonderful moment where in nineteen ninety nine, when you were a teenager and you were kind of ready to rebel, you were like, Yeah, I know which one doesn't lead to anywhere. That fucking cubicle shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I mean the movie baits you for that moment. It does you know, it's a little bit it's something else you picked up on is when uh his friend knocks on his door. Um, with all the goth kids I went yeah, to the club with right. and talks about how he needs to unplug. Yeah. It's just this, this separate thing that I never picked up on it either yeah. for as many times as I've seen the movie that you go back through and just these, these strange little details. It's kind of like a, it's almost like a, a thing about fate where right. they're commenting on, you know, fate and the path that he's taking the idea of the one. Yeah. Yeah, so all of that being part of that look. I mean, where The House of the Devil was a movie that was, it kind of was made recently to feel like it was from that era. Sure. I feel like someone needs to make a movie, uh, much like these lost 90s films. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe that could be my calling. The stupid thing I contribute to film is Uh just somehow making things look like the crappy uh, late 90s aesthetic. That's certainly aiming low. I'm just thinking, you know, the, the thing that really brings those movies down isn't so much their aesthetic but no. the crappy effects. yeah it's really i mean if i know i mentioned it not too long ago but we covered it pretty much extensively on lawnmower man jurassic park right uh that kind of embodies what's wrong with a lot of 90s films as far as special effects go not to say that the matrix has crap oh effect. no not at all see that's what the matrix is is great is yeah. it's 1999 and the effects are still better than avatar still yeah it's still great the um i mean right from the opening you know, there's this uh, Trinity, the badass pan around her while she's sure. in midair. The 360, where you first realize, oh, well, I guess we're going to see the camera. Where There's no camera there. Uh, yeah, right. The, you know, it's one of these tricks they pull out immediately just to let you know this is incredibly badass, but still pretty real world. You don't get a moment uh, where you start to move into what the fuck is going on uh-huh. territory. This is just people are badass and the camera... Sure is what the fuck well to go back to kind of the uh our 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 journey from last week it's Mm -hmm. kind of reminiscent of the japanese people can fly but they're still people sure thing we also talked about it with hero yeah it's uh nothing outside of phenomenal martial arts that sort of thing it's not supposed to create a fantastic world just kind of emphasize the current realistic one exactly 
so Trinity, Neo, and Morpheus are our three uh, incredibly amazing, badass, super Absolutely. boss characters who are wandering around this city that, by the way, is not Chicago. You notice that? That's a little weird. With yeah, the, it, all the with street intersections street are Chicago names. Right, and they have, you know, I noticed the Aeon building, too, although it doesn't look anything like the Aeon building mm-hmm. in Chicago. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure all of the movie was filmed in Australia or Toronto or one of those fake Chicago. It definitely you know. didn't look like any city I'd seen pointed out in a film. Right. I think the directors grew up in Chicago, and that's probably where Wachowski's. a lot of that uh, came from. That and I remember something about early drafts of the movie had it set here right or something to that effect. I wanted to talk, though, not so much about those uh, those three characters who are all over everything, mm-hmm. everywhere, but the characters that nobody fucking talks about. The supporting ever. guys that... The crew. The group of red shirts and <laughs> Cypher. <laughs> exactly. The group of red shirts and the blue shirt who betrays the red shirts. Yeah. I want to talk about APOC first sure. because I don't know who the fuck APOC is. Right. No matter how many times I watch this movie. APOC's the utility. Movie. Okay. Consider APOC the utility. He's the driver. He's the phone guy. Okay, right. You know, he, he never really gets into the action, but you need him. He is the programmer even in the reality. Right. Even in the, uh, the super set. Yeah. And then you have Switch, who's kind of backup gun slash lesbian. Right. Switch is the, the blonde-haired uh, yeah. woman. All in white. She's the, the one that dresses in white. She's sort of, I don't want to say she's cocky, yeah. but she's kind of doesn't want to deal with this bullshit, yep. doesn't buy into the one. And then uh, uh, Cypher. Sure. Cypher who, Joe Pantoliano. Who is one of the only people who really had an outside the Matrix yeah. well, kind he, of... Well, he kind of had a thing before the Matrix and then went off after the... Sure. I, you know, it's because I think... You just hate him so much. Right. You hate him so fucking right. much. Yeah, he's such a dick. He's great. Yeah. But when he sets him up, I just want to shout at the screen, you're ruining all the cool. <laughs> yeah, you're ruining humanity, really. You're wrecking all the fun we're having. You sell out fuck. But that steak, it just tastes yeah. so good. Yeah. I haven't had a steak in probably 13 years. I don't... What does a steak taste like? Is that pretty accurate? I, he didn't say what it tasted like. He said it tasted juicy. I believe he said, mm-mm, good. Is that yeah, you know, kind of how pretty you close. would describe steak? It probably steak. tastes better than uh, proteins and all the amino acids you need. Vegetarian, not animal rights person. So there's Cypher, and we talked about, uh, we talked about Joe a bit back during... Oh, geez, all the way back in Memento. Yeah. Um, where he was fantastic in that He's movie, really too. really good in that. Now, these other main characters had careers outside sure. of the Matrix. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne and Carrie Ann Moss uh-huh. and Keanu Reeves. Yep. But, you know, it's so weird. Again, this is maybe just us growing up during the Matrix, but it seems like that's who those people are. Yeah, they really are. I mean, Empire Magazine, we talked about the photo shoot back when we did American Psycho. Sure. But they also did another one with Lawrence Fishburne. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just, you're you're totally right. They have they embody these characters. They're, uh, you just seem to always think about them as their characters from The Matrix. Keanu Reeves did a bunch of Bill and Ted stuff before this. Sure. I mean, he's well known for some other roles. Um, Lawrence Fishburne, we talked about him on Pee Wee, right? When we yeah, did, uh, he did Pee Wee that with Penn and Teller get killed, yeah. not in that particular movie, but right. in, you know, in the sure. Pee Wee fiction mm-hmm. and Carrie Ann Moss, actually, uh, another person who was in Memento, right. And in the aristocrats as also well. Also Fido. So we've seen these people all over the show and mm-hmm. sometimes off of the show when you think they're on the show, <laughs> uh, but always remember him from the matrix. So that was Cypher, but there's a couple other people too. There's Tank and Dozer, right. who I'm trying to remember. Tank is always the smaller one, right. and Dozer is the bigger one. Right. right. And they're both born outside the Matrix. They don't have any of the jack-in ports. Sure. They're homegrown homeboys. Right. They're brothers, and they're introduced together. And for some reason, I can't figure out if a tank is supposed to be bigger than a bulldozer. Yeah, it's and really... I always get them confused because of that. It depends on the kind of tank, I guess. And uh, there's one more, too. Mouse. Mm-hmm. Mouse is this character, and I always remember when I first saw The Matrix, mm-hmm. loving Mouse because he was tiny, he was into sex, right. he was nerdy. He was the closest character to me Sure. when The Matrix came out. Yeah, right. And... He gets this moment, this badass, dual-wielding, super gun moment. And I remember as a kid thinking, yes, Mouse is going to kill him, and he just dies. Right. And your heart breaks. (laughs) Right. Well, he dies, and then shortly after, everybody is helplessly unplugged. Yeah. It just feels awful. They all, you know, this is, uh, I can't remember ever seeing in a movie where people are basically put down in their sleep Mm -hmm. in such a way. 
you know, you have this heroic, rebellious crew. They're going to take down the fucking man. And instead, they all just get unplugged and they just fall over. Yeah. They're fucking helpless. There is not, it's such a, a cowardly way to yeah. kill people, which is another one of the reasons we hate yeah. Cypher. And Switch gets this moment where she says, not like this. And that's exactly what you're thinking. Yeah. You've seen these people. You've seen that they're all fucking cool as hell. Right. And you want to see them go down in a mouse-like blaze of glory. Right. But instead, they not just so. flop over because the needle got pulled out of the back of their oh, head. Awful. And that's it for them. That's all you get. You know, so that helpless feel is amazing, but also the brief moments of kind of terror in this movie. Sure. Neil climbing uh, outside the building. Yeah. Um, but uh, really, the biggest one I always remember is his mouth closing up. With which the mirror? Is, no, not the oh, mirror. The where his one. Yeah, sure. where his mouth is closing in the interrogation yeah. room. Because that's the first time you venture into a real other world. Yeah. Where you really start. I mean, you saw Trinity get hit by a fucking truck. And she survives. And that's a little otherworldly. But you don't really know all the components of that yet. You start to see his mouth close up. And that's where it becomes, oh, shit, what is this movie yeah. about? What are we doing that here? Is, that is the beginning of an endless series of mind freaks. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Well, that and the bug goes in his stomach after sure. that, which is kind of... Well, the bug that starts as a little robot diode right turns right. into a bug then turns back into a diode we have those bugs in our studio i don't know if you've ever seen yeah, them I they haven't. are disgusting these are all the icons i mean i feel as if i i really mean this without exaggeration nearly every single scene is an icon sure is a memorable thing that has been parodied that has been talked about, that has been referenced in other places. That just has become an embodiment of the Matrix. Something as simple as Morpheus's sunglasses. Right. Still to this day, if I see a pair of sunglasses on the ground and just the sides have been snapped off, sure. Not, doesn't even have to look like Morpheus's right. sunglasses. I right. look down and think to myself, oh, Morpheus's sunglasses. Is that your head voice? That's my head That's voice. That's really amazing. Yeah. Uh, from Trinity breaking in in the beginning... The cubicles, you know, sure. hanging out outside the window. Agent the, Smith in general. The bug planting. The meeting with Morpheus in those big red fucking sure. chairs. I mean, all of it. Every goddamn Take scene the red in this pill. movie. Yeah, right? So, you know, the dialogue is iconic. Just the little phrases. Yeah. Um, I know Kung Fu. Believe it or not, you piece of shit, you're still going to burn. Oh, man. All the stuff with the spoon. Oh, um, which that's not actually as sad as it is. The Matrix is not the first time we've heard there is no spoon on double feature. <laughs> no, it's not. Somebody one up to them. <laughs> not fair. It's just not fair. Thanks, Neil Marshall. And then the actors themselves. I was talking about their career, but even the props, the goddamn sets. Yep. Infinite white space. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've talked about that before on double feature. But those fucking chairs, sure. the chairs they're sitting in when they have that meeting, yep. the big red beaten out armchairs, mm -hmm. like this place used to be a mansion and now is just kind of a hellhole. Right. But it doesn't even matter since it's part of the matrix. They right. can code it to be whatever the fuck yeah. they want. The liquid going down Neo's throat and sure. making that uh, that expanded, time compressed, sure. bit crushed kind of sound. The lobby with the pillars, I always think, is is yeah, another right. iconic just set that they use. Well, sure, and part of the action sequences sure. that people remember. Yeah, and the wet room with Morpheus chained up. So a lot of that is iconic just because of uh, the comic book style. How it seems so illustrated, you could see it on a fucking page. Uh -huh. It's just these uh, these bold things burned into your memory. But I think another part of that comes from how many people saw the movie and how the movie forced them to think about it, you know, nonstop, solving it, unlocking its yeah. puzzle, going back over it. The uh, the amount of mindfuck type scenes sure. throughout this movie are part of what burns those icons in your mind. Yeah. You know, the first time you're going through it, trying to figure out what the Matrix is. Uh -huh. No one can be told what the <laughs> Matrix is, right? And, and now it all makes sense. Sure. Now that we've seen it and we know everybody gets the Matrix, computer world, outside, reality, reality outside computer world, I uh -huh. suppose is what that is. But what Morpheus says at the time when you're first going through it sure. is fucking indecipherable. Every single line he utters is a goddamn riddle. Yep. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Oh, why do my eyes hurt? You've never used them before. What the fuck right. does it mean? You're saying what that I can dodge bullets? About? 
right? <laughs> he says it's closer to twenty one ninety nine. That doesn't help. Yeah, that just makes this whole goddamn thing worse. You're thinking, oh, that whole thing's a fake world, and here's the real world, and he's basically saying. Oh, that fake world? Well, it's actually the past, and the real world's the future. And later you figure out that the real world, of course, is also in the future, and the fake world is in your head, but it's set in the past. But that doesn't make any fucking sense at the time. So every little thing is a clue, but it also just makes things harder. Mm -hmm. It makes things more complicated. You know, talking about what is real, how do you define real, the entire idea of we're questioning reality. It sounds like a fucking pot burnout. You have no idea what this man is talking about you almost think he's crazy yeah and the rest of the crew draws his sanity into question just in regard to neo being the one Mm -hmm. but that makes you question does this guy have any fucking clue what he's talking about alternate reality matrix super thing inside your head it's totally the future what the fuck does that mean and the thing about all of these ridiculous clues and tricks and plays on words and just the way infinite white space exposition they manipulate the reality the most impressive part of all that is that when the credits roll at the end of the film, you don't have any questions. You sound like Morpheus. You totally understand everything that's going on. Nothing is left open-ended, fully comprehend it, and you don't feel like they played a dirty trick on you. Not or that at they, all. That they misled you by saying this, that, or the other thing. They weren't everything, even being purposefully cryptic, yeah. you know? It's uh, it's all as if he was just trying to do the best job he can right. explaining it. It's amazing because that's something that you rarely get. You rarely get the mind freak that actually pays off. It's pretty much just Chris Angel and The Matrix, I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Chris Angel. The Matrix was sort of the popularization of this, uh, this mindfuck moment. Arguably, you could say it's never been done better. I no, mean, I, I would fully agree. The fact that you end the movie and you have every single piece kind of in your lap and in your head, you've just about connected all of them. I mean, you're thinking it can't possibly all make sense. They're just making this shit up as they go. And then it becomes perfectly obvious by the end. Not even difficult. Not even you have to strain to put it mm-hmm. together. You basically, by the time the credits sure. roll kind of have everything yep. and it all makes sense and i feel like every film you can only do it this good yeah rarely can you really do it better yeah you, i agree you either don't give people enough clues and they have to think extra hard which mm-hmm. is okay which sure. is the better of the options primer. yeah primer is a great example of that all the david lynch stuff is a good example mm-hmm. of that um a primer is really the the pinnacle of that you know you have to really try and solve primer and it's very hard And that's not necessarily worse. It's definitely not worse. It's just an -hmm. an alternate. The way I think it's more commonly done is the kind of stuff we talked about in uh, High Tension. Sure. Fuck the end of that movie, by the way. I'm still pissed about that. Where by the time you get to the end, you kind of say, wait, none of that makes sense. Yeah. If I watch this again, none of that shit's going to hold up. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a lot of movies just, they sort of started having these these turns before we made fun of it as Mind Freak. Yeah. It was what a twist. Yep. You know, that became what M. Night Shyamalan was known for. Sure. People wanted to see twists in their movies. And it, and the the problem with that is is exactly like you said, the twist often doesn't make sense upon a rewatch of the sure. film or upon completing the film as if no one working on the movie ever watched it twice right. themselves exactly. that was it yeah imagine our show is probably like that once we start to get a handle on the plot once we have uh a good deal of exposition that feels uh generally okay which is strange feels totally okay i yeah. don't know if it's just because it's so memorable And you just know it as, you know, line by line what Morpheus says when he's talking to Neo and showing him stuff on the TV of what the world actually looks like. Yeah. And then they start learning Kung Fu. That's just how the movie unravels. So you don't call it out on it. It needs that so it can then move into philosophy. Because if it wasn't enough to create a world with all these rules, they have to ask you all these philosophical questions. Yeah. That's one of the great things about the movie is giving you those extra details like that to play with. There are definitely things that relate to our own reality. Mm -hmm. And then there are things that are kind of bullshit in our reality, but relate to the reality of the matrix. You know, there's a question, uh, is ignorance bliss? Sure. Right. That's a, that's a big theme that comes up. That's Mm -hmm. the red pill, blue pill, right? Yeah, exactly. Do you want to know or, or don't you, we could probably do an entire show on that, right? Yeah. I'm a very reality based person. I guess I would probably fall on wanting to know reality. I, you know, I'd 
think about that, but at the same time, I can't. It's a hard be question. Sure. It comes down to where you exist. If you exist in your brain, what your brain sees is reality, regardless of whether that reality is being put into your brain by a machine or put into your brain by other senses. It's really kind of the same thing. That starts to eventually get into the idea of fate, right? And uh, predetermination. Mm-hmm. And we could even extrapolate that out to, you know, talking about... Destiny. Um, yeah, talking about destiny. Talking about, I mean, really scientific destiny. Yeah. Uh, down to how your brain chemicals fire. Sure. And that you Genetic probably... Makeup. Yeah, you probably don't have free will because yeah. your brain does the things sure. that it does because of chemicals. Nothing religious about it. Nothing uh, path laid out for you by a higher being about it. Just simply that you don't have control over how your neurons are firing. Surface questions, uh, the themes, really, yeah. of the Matrix. Yeah. The stuff I really kind of like is when they invoke little things um, like the vase, right? Mm-hmm. If I hadn't said anything, would you still have sure. knocked it over? And then that that snowballs into if she had never said anything about him not being the one, would he have ended up being the one? Right, right. They keep doing this thing with the Oracle she says what you needed to hear. Yeah. But then it gets called into question, who the hell is she to decide <laughs> right. what you need to hear? Right. A, a question the movie ultimately never really answers. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, the thing I like about that is in our own reality, that's kind of a bullshit question. Like if a tree falls in the forest yeah. and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Of course, it makes a goddamn sound, you fucking idiot. But in the movie, there's actually a purpose to this within the fiction. This is an exercise for your mind. It's a philosophical exercise that is conducted within the matrix to teach you about the world of the matrix. Yes. Or if not to teach you about that universe, to at least get you thinking about it. Absolutely. What is the role? This isn't uh, an empty question like tree in the forest in Uh our world. This is a question about what does the Oracle know? Uh What does fate say? How does fate control this universe? And how does that play into the programming, the very tangible programming of the matrix? Yeah. In the same way that deja vu plays in, if you are made aware of a construct of the matrix, does that affect how the matrix plays out? You could make that a very real question sure. about that simulated environment for right. them instead of a bullshit question. How far can you bend gravity right. knowing that gravity no longer really exists? Yeah, just like the rules they play jumping off a building. Um, just like the, uh, you know, we see at the ending of the film with, uh, with the bullets and seeing that. Yeah. Seeing through that green matrix code, a kind of one of those scenes where it really starts to click for you sure. if it hasn't already. Right. You know exactly, okay, we're talking about manipulating code. We're talking about seeing through it and uh, Neil really being able to affect that code yeah. himself. These become questions that are almost plot questions as mm-hmm. much as philosophical questions. So that's double feature on the matrix, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Uh, really, if this were any other movie, we would have stuck to one stupid philosophical sure. question and talked about it the entire yeah. time. But I mean, that's pretty much everywhere. Yeah. You can find nobody's at a loss of places yeah. to I hear mean, about people yeah. talk about the Matrix here. To be honest, there's plenty more to cover, but we we can't cover it all. Uh, like the Trinity dodge this fisheye wide angle lens oh, scene. So fucking fantastic. <laughs> it really is. I never thought I would enjoy a, a fisheye lens anywhere in anything. That was It was great. If I could have one more piece and uh, I, you know, I could go on for 20 minutes and instead I can just say this. I want people to look at the soundtrack for this movie, the original soundtrack for The Matrix, and then read through track by track. And I want you to imagine me reading it on the show and just saying fucking brilliant song after each track. Okay. Just the first one. Eric thinks fucking brilliant song. What about the second song? Oh, that song is fucking brilliant. Just every single, all the way down the track listing. Probably. I haven't actually looked at the track uh-huh. listing. There might be some bullshit on there somewhere. Probably not. And we're going to need people to email us about something too. I don't really know uh, how to, to touch on this on the show. It's yeah. It's kind of awkward. I'll cover it. I'll make it quick. There are two directors to the film. The film was directed by the Wachowski brothers. Sure. We're interested in talking about directors. Uh, it didn't do that today. We'll probably do to another one of their films at some point in order to cover them more in depth. I know they did Bound, and I kind of want to do Bound. I'm into that. The thing is, is there's rumors that Larry Wachowski is now Lana Wachowski. Sure. There's evidence that may or may not be made up. Right. It is all the internet. And, I mean, email us if you know the, if you know the real story. sources, I think. 
We're interested in this in much less the uh, the gross tabloid yeah, way. Yeah, it's not it's not a circus freak show way. It's just kind of a factual thing about the director's yeah. way. It's uh, just a really part of it is the hoax nature of this. Yeah, I can't. The fact that I don't know if one of the people who made this movie identifies as a woman or not. That's weird. Yeah. I need to know. Like, how how do you not have that piece of information? Sure. That uh, adds this strange. It adds a fucking Batman layer of mystery to right. this. I don't even know who's behind this movie. Um, we just want to know more about these directors so we can cover them at a later show. Yeah. So if you have that information, any sort of real source, we can't find it anywhere. Yeah. We can't get a we can't get a solid source on any of this. Right. So Weird. that'd be double feature show at gmail dot com. I think that makes it rollerball time, right? Oh, it's fucking rollerball time. I guess I was just mentioning music. That should be a good place to start. Yeah, we did. Uh, we did the trial a while we ago. We did. I was talking about the great opening music and the great ending music. Um, I don't know a lot about classical music, mm-hmm. admittedly. I think we've covered to death my limited set of... It's just Nine Inch Nails, people. Just Nine Inch <laughs> Nails. That's all I know. That song from the trial reappears here. Uh-huh. I think it's called Adagio in G minor. Uh-huh. My pronunciation is probably... I. You know, what's even worse is trying to figure out the composer. Uh-huh. Because there's a little bit of a controversy kind of surrounding who actually made this uh-huh. or some misinformation there as far as who should be credited. I think it's Remo Giazzotto might be the sure. name. Sounds Italian enough. Uh, just so people can hunt down this piece of music. So they know music. what you're talking about. For some weird reason, I hear the first two notes mm-hmm. of that and I know it anywhere. And I, I don't know why it's <laughs> the strangest thing. You know what else bugged the shit out of me is that there is a sample in the beginning of the uh, swell party scene. Sure. Of just, again, a couple notes and I knew it was from a fucking Sneaker Pimp song. Uh-huh. And it distracted me for an hour. <laughs> I, I was going nuts. It's, it's the song um, Sick off the album Bloodsport when Chris Corner started singing for the Sneaker Pimps and not that chick who did... Uh, I Know Nothing. Okay, doesn't matter. Six Underground was the, the song with the... Again, doesn't matter. So they sampled a few notes of that and they use it in the song and uh, that's not where the music stops. There's also full-blown organ, future organ. Yeah, there's going future on organ. There's also, don't forget how the film starts and ends. Mm-hmm. We get the fantastic Dracula, sure. <laughs> Phantom of the Opera style right. organ song. It's weird to mention Phantom of the Opera because Adagio was also in Robert England's Phantom oh, of the Opera wow. as well. The song shows up all over the place. So why don't you explain to me what you understand about Rollerball the Sport? Okay, so this is weird. This movie, <laughs> this is a bold movie. Uh, yeah. Of course, it being in the 70s, it can get away with this sure. shit. Uh, the opening is literally, almost to the second, 15 fucking minutes of a sport that isn't explained right. in the slightest. A non-existent sport that they do not explain. This is not MTV generation. <laughs> this is not, let's give you a two-minute cutscene with some fast music of the sport it's literally as if you were skipping across tv stations and you found the sport and right. watched it for 15 goddamn minutes trying to figure out what the <laughs> hell was going on so much as we did with death race 2000 uh-huh um loving the sport there and these two movies i mean would go great oh, to each sure, other they really would. i think they're probably linked very often for the things they do here are what i i'm bad with sports i'm going to uh-huh. explain what i know about rollerball okay. right uh, there's roller skating in there's a circle, skating. right? That's important. Uh-huh. A ball goes in a hole, Yep. which is uh, most sports. Mm-hmm. Some kind of metal ball looks like you could bludgeon someone's fucking uh, brains out with it. There's a lot of violence that seems yep. to get encouraged <laughs> through uh, yep. to the end of the movie. Um, you can block the hole. That's important, mm-hmm. too. So you can kind of stand in front of it. And uh, the ball is fired down a track. It looks like yeah. a roulette wheel. Yeah. It's I mean, fired uh, almost as if I would gone. I guess there's bikes too. There's That's important. yeah. There's motorcycles and, and skitching. And the scoreboard has the numbers of the players on right, it, right? Which they the lights go out if they seems get. to be an arbitrary number of lights after. Is that uh-huh. their health meter? I it, let's say it's their health meter. And then a little blinking light next to them if they score a point. Yep. Yeah, that's really all there is to rollerball. The only other major thing to note when discussing rollerball the sport is jonathan e is the fucking champion uh, i thought you were going to say oppressive corporations yeah but... well that's 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 more roll. no you're right that is a very important part of rollerball the sport so also J- rollerball the film james uh james khan who was mm-hmm. in misery was misery right yeah yeah who uh you were talking about zupan earlier i mean yeah. he's our zupan in the film 
He is also the only person on the team. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. there's a bunch of people you never meet. Right. And, uh, and James Conn's character. That kind of comes down to being what it seems that that is what they ostensibly point out. Sure. Is the motivation to the film is that Jonathan E has become the champion. He can win the game single handedly. The game is meant to point out that people can't succeed alone. Right. They need groups and they have to operate on a team level because individuals can't succeed. And he is in direct violation of that precept. And so he needs to retire. Okay. They need to wipe out Jonathan E because he's setting a precedent. Individualism. almost yeah. Completely dangerous for a government that I believe they say is the only thing they ask is that you don't question them. Sure. The one rule. Right? Yeah. The one rule. Obey all rules. So what does this future look like? We have these big corporations. Sure. Right? There's about How, six of them. And they are the political system? Yeah. It's kind of like, it's almost like the presidential cabinet, but instead of being divided by defense, agriculture, interior, you know, homeland Internet security, czar, right? Yeah. it's instead they're divided by essentially monopolized corporations of public needs. We have energy. Sure. Chicago's a food town. I don't know. Things that if you imagine something that you buy every day. Right. Say, for example, toiletries, right? Okay. That you can buy from 10, 11,000 different companies that manufacture toiletries. So that's Nevada. Nevada becomes the sure. toiletries. Right? Well, you know, they become household. They become the household town. And right. It's all, sure. you know, the things you would need for a good household living life. Right. And they've become the big six figureheads of the government. It's all corporate owned. There was a corporate war. Sure. There is no corporate longer... war after the three nations, right? right? Whatever right. The hell that means. And there's no longer any political system outside of this. You know, it's, it's a capitalistic planet ruled by the CEOs of the most powerful companies. It'd be like if Viacom, Disney, GE, etc., ran the United States and we had no internet. Yeah, the no internet is the, the key there, <laughs> the key to the masses. It's also kind of the 60s, 70s sort of future where um, beyond just the font. Yeah, it's almost the, like the world of tomorrow. Right. The kind of um, ancient Epcot uh, yeah. sort of future, you know, where everything's white or plexiglass. And round. Right. And, and round, because round is really where the round future is. Round is the future. We're still using uh, old crappy computers. Uh -huh. Round is the future. But we're Everywhere using gigantic television or multivisions. Yeah. Big, big, big fucking televisions uh, and giant bell bottoms. Yeah. Uh, and giant collars as well. The long, huge <laughs> fucking 70s collars. Which, I mean, you know, it's totally fine. Fashion comes back around in yeah. waves and in the future, maybe bell bottoms. I'm kind of wearing bell bottoms right now. I'm not huh. going to lie. They have zippers on them, though. Uh, what was I talking about? You were talking about the 70s future. Oh, thank you. They also have exploding fire tree guns. Yeah. Can't say I really remember what the point of that was <laughs> because I was so distracted by tree fireballs. Here's, here's what I think is going on in that scene. Mm -hmm. is That is where you get the final moment where Jonathan and the energy executive, mm -hmm. energy owns Houston, which is right. the team that Jonathan plays on. And you get the energy executive who essentially says, I don't make the rules. You've got to retire. There's no other option. And every time Jonathan kind of shrugs it off, says, I'm not going to do it. They blow up another tree. Right. You see, there are right. six trees. It's almost kind of this weird biblical almost reference to denying your chances and that or just to make the hippies cringe right because well, really yeah it could be either or that's the point of the giant capitalist overlords yeah. too showing how capitalism a world is crushing, by capitalism. is crushing beauty and freedom yeah, and right. thought and the other thing that i really like about rollerball is that the protagonist in rollerball is a fucking meathead <laughs> Okay, we have Jonathan E. We're rooting for Jonathan E. Mm -hmm. Nobody is behind him more than I am at the end of this film. Sure. And I know you want to talk about what, the end of the film, that last Absolutely. game versus New York. But before that, I want to talk about Jonathan as a protagonist. 
Can so, we talk about his friend with the mustache briefly? Oh, Moon Pie? Yeah, he's in the movie too. Yeah, we forgot to mention him during the team. He is the other human being on that team. Yeah. He basically represents the rest of the team. Sure. He represents the fun-loving guy that's there to back him up, but never will overshadow him. And certainly doesn't want to use any Asian mysticism yeah. in his game. <laughs> Uh, he's just going to give 110% instead. Yep, that's his punch strategy. him in the face. That's all we need. All right. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail you there. That's fine. So we have Jonathan E., who is this total jock. Mm -hmm. We're in a 1984-esque, futuristic, anti-free thought society. And this is usually the situation where a poetic guy will come up with free thinking or a scientific guy will realize some radical new discovery, work his way up through the ranks. Brazil, perfect example. I was thinking Brazil or the uh, the underground from Equilibrium, yeah. right? Yeah. All about poetry sure. and art. But instead we get this guy who the reason, okay, I know you can go there because we just talked about the Matrix and you just outed yourself what you were doing around you know, the beginning of this era for you. Sure. The last person you expect to be the guy that goes up through the ranks is a jock who just doesn't want to give up right. what he's good at. Right. This is the guy who won't stop talking about his high school football career. Right. He won't let go the fact that he lives exclusively through being a sports champion. Sure. And that ends up being this horrific thing that undoes a brilliantly orchestrated government. Yeah, and what a bizarre element for a movie, you know, especially as I'm watching the ominous corporate overlord and I'm thinking back to uh when we covered Tron sure. and how we're, you know, we're doing these violent kind of games for the for basically no reason uh -huh. for some obscure figureheads some shadowy figureheads uh, delight mm -hmm. uh, here. It seems like even this panel of corporate people are answering to some greater capitalistic right. instinct, a bubbly piece that, of water. Yeah. That doesn't have a, doesn't have a name or a face yeah. isn't a soul, but sure. just rather an idea. Right. And you know, to think back to Tron, that was, I talked about some personal shit on that show too, just about being an arcade kid yeah. growing up in the hippie generation. I understand rebelling against capitalism. Yeah. That makes sense for this movie. Sure. Uh, my generation growing up and the time I had in high school, the jocks were the evil corporate. Yeah, you know, right? they were the exactly. evil enemy. Exactly. They were the fucking masses. Sure. Fuck that guy. Right. It was, uh, it was always just, they represented the pure evil and the most sure. base and the most yeah. soulless. And I mean, they're probably all fine. They're probably great people, yeah. but in high school, they were lowest common denominator. Yeah, you know what right. I mean? Right. So thinking back to the Matrix days, sure. uh, you know, the hero is going to grow up and crush the sure the ugly jo duckling sort of thing. Yeah. Even in the 80s, that was yeah. Revenge of the Nerds. You know, right. that was um, that was even a little bit in Tron. So yeah. you, you saw that a lot of places. And then back in Rollerball, you get this guy who's dumb. Yeah. He doesn't he's not smart. He doesn't know history. He doesn't know how to get to a library. <laughs> right. He's not really sure what's going on. Right. All he knows is something bad is happening and he doesn't want to stop playing rollerball. Good hearted but a Sure. Head. I mean, best of intentions really can't figure out what to do with them. What's great about it and and this is where we can really talk about this horrible carnage that is the final tournament game is he beats them. By playing rollerball. <laughs> right. By being good at the sport. <laughs> it's weird because this is the genre of films that was for the nerdy 80s kid. Yeah. That was for, I mean, obviously it came out far before that, but uh, the kind of movies uh, I would have been into growing up had I watched more movies, mm -hmm. I mean, this would have fallen right in with that stuff. Sure. Dystopia and science fiction, the entire science fiction genre. I mean, it wasn't exactly for the jock. Uh -huh. But this falls more in line with uh, sports movies. Yeah. It's more like if Hoosiers. you're if you're a fan with... I can't even think of the names of any of these. Uh, something Giants, Titans. Oh, remember might, the Titans? Titan Giants. Remember the Titans, Little Giants. Really, Hoosiers fits right in too. Yeah. I'm thinking of the Amazon recommendation. You yeah. know, if you the like... The Mighty Ducks. If you like, like the Mighty Ducks, you may like Rollerball. Yeah. It sort of would function, hypothetically, mm -hmm. as a science fiction dystopia movie for people who just want to see someone right. win it. It starts with a fucking 15-minute sure. sports match right. that you don't even know the and rules it's, to. It seems like real. It yeah, seems it does. like they actually believe... It does, absolutely. Rollerball's a real thing. Yeah. And the end is just like that, 
but with no fucking rules. <laughs> yeah, right. So after we discuss this ending, I'm going to run by you what I actually think is going on. Okay, great. Behind... Great, because I wasn't even going to cover what the hell is happening <laughs> in Rollerball. First, there's one thing that we both know is going on, and mm. it's that everyone fucking dies <laughs> right? in this last yeah, Rollerball match. It's the thing that gets your movie on double feature. Yeah. That's, you know, we spend all this that's time talking about great really, film for jocks. That's what I remember most of when the first time I watched this, is I remember watching this last game and going, everyone is fucking dying what Left the hell right. is it happening is here? yeah absolutely there's just complete carnage it's uh i mean it's a war zone it's yeah. mad max sure by the yes. end of this absolutely there's, you know there's people getting thrown off bikes sure. left and right uh thrown through fences heads being run over right right and a fire everywhere yeah. you get this explosive <laughs> fireball you know so by the end the backdrop for the the scenes i mean it's all just flames yeah. and carnage and wreckage and he's on top of a man about to beat him in the face <laughs> against the right? fire with this giant fucking titanium ball yeah and even really the final frame of the movie it's the 300 triple zoom yeah. that we uh, right. that we talked about into this really kind of disturbing yeah you know after everything gets really silent yeah. and then gets amped back up yeah in this uh this sort of goosebumps inducing sports triumph yeah you because you get the end of the game where the only point scored is by jonathan after everyone is dead and then everybody starts cheering for him and he kind of does a bunch of victory laps mm. and you think oh he finally beat everyone yeah he won he finally you know, got what he deserves. Sure, sure. And then it freezes and zooms in on him and zooms in on him. And that's when you realize he is still in the same place he was in the <laughs> right, beginning. Right. He just won a tournament. Feasibly, if he just slaughters everybody anywhere who plays right. rollerball. Basically, that's I don't know if that option. would help him because then he can't play rollerball right. anymore. It's, oh, what it's, a bummer. He's in a catch 22 here. Oh, God. So what the fuck happens in rollerball? Okay. So there's, they discuss, and we touched on it, where individuality not good for our government right take out jonathan e hopefully he'll retire otherwise we need to expend him that's part of the plot of the movie is that he's trying to figure out the plot of right. the movie exactly he wants so to know, true. hold on what's the motivation here why are yeah. they trying to retire me yeah and we get this scene in the very beginning before we realize the executive is is bad people mm -hmm. in the locker room when he is kind of giving the team a pep talk hey good job you guys look mean yeah he says this thing, and I, I think it's a brilliant thing. He says, all of you guys down here really wish you could be executives and, you know, have the pampered sweet offices and the chill lifestyle and all the money, but executives are up there wishing they could be down here and be the most ripple-muscled, badass right. rollerball player there is. Absolutely. And I love that he says that because I absolutely believe that's true. Mm -hmm. I believe that... Everybody wants what they don't have, in a, sure. especially in a situation where it's where it's being a sports player versus being a high end businessman. I Grass believe that, is always greener on the other side. You glamorize that. Yeah. And so I really feel like this. And tell me if you can see this. I feel like the executives are not only threatened by the individuality here, but they've seen this guy champion through three years of rollerball mm. no sorry six years of rollerball sure not failing always winning tons of records do you think and this is what i'm thinking they see him as okay well they can't beat him but we're the executives we can take down anyone yeah right that you know they're basically putting themselves down in the rollerballers place like, oh, yeah, you stupid rollerballers aren't tough enough to take out right, this champion. Sure. Well, we snap our fingers and he's done. Right, yeah. It's kind of this role reversal where they're thinking, we can do what the men that we want to be can't achieve. Right, right. It's an exercise of power. Yeah. Uh, something you could probably make the argument for even in oppression of freedom and sure. modern day politics. Right. It's them saying, you know, they use maybe the excuse yeah. that, all right, sure. he's, he's too much of an individual. Yeah. He is a one man team. It's himself. not a game. You yeah, know, this was right. never a game. Like they give a shit anyways. <laughs> and in reality, they see, you know, they see somebody sticking out and yeah. they just want to press him back into the collective. Exactly. To prove that they can. Yeah. To prove that they are capable of sure. being 
stars and champions and that they are they are just as badass right. as the finest rollerball player perhaps even more so exactly. for being able to subdue him so i know i don't know that's definitely something i get out of rollerball mm-hmm. i think there's a lot buried in rollerball it's one I, of those movies and this is uh seeing it for the first time myself mm-hmm. i get the impression that it's intentionally uh and you know a lot of movies from the 70s do this so i don't know if this is just style right yeah. but that it, it we talked about this with colossus too where it's uh, just vague enough to allow you some more interpretation that may say more about yourself internally yeah, than about what the, I films, agree fully. the film's talking about. But, you know, we're spending all this time talking about uh, the idea of a sports fanatic, mm-hmm. um, you know, as a, a viewer of this film or a participant in the sport himself. We're talking about these guys trying to suppress individuality. And you can certainly read that into it, I'm not sure that was designed in the script, right? But I think what was designed in the script, or at least a um, an artifact of the time, was leaving enough open to that, you know, to read into it that sure. way, to allow yourself uh, to let this film speak to a couple different things for you. I fully agree. I love Rollerball. You know who else probably loves Rollerball? We didn't give her a shout out at the year end. It's been a while. Sheila, you know Sheila? Oh yeah. Um, I imagine when she's playing uh, Derby that yeah. she is actually playing roller She's playing ball. rollerball? I think anybody, first of all, can I just give like a massive, anybody who plays roller derby, yeah. email us about it. Yeah, I'm please. not really sure I what I want you it. to email I us. I want to hear but, about how many people you've killed yeah. playing roller derby. Um, that gets me into the website, I think, which is doublefeatureshow.com and that email address, once again, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. All right, so I guess next time on the show, we're going to do uh, Shaun of the Dead and Glengarry Glen Ross. This was your idea. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's a, uh, a working class, the waking dead yeah, idea. Sure. Um, I have never watched Shaun of the Dead with this in mind, so I'm kind of curious. Um, so I guess with that, uh, watch more fucking film. Bye.